A certain little bird inspired some of our research for a recent video on elements introduced by Granola. We decided to make a deeper dive into the world of interviews with Toyotaro that were conducted by Victory Uchida. You know the one. The guy with the hair who is also the editor for the Dragon Ball Super manga and has basically sort of been lighting the flames underneath us, trying to hype up something that shouldn't be. But to our surprise, we discovered that these interviews have much more insight into what has happened in the manga for the last two years than we initially anticipated, clouded by the anger of repeating a movie arc. And it seems to have been generally ignored by the community. Well, not anymore. Well, I mean, the buffering on the official site is abysmal, so that doesn't help. So I don't blame people for not watching it due to that experience. But it does seem that people are overlooking a lot of really valuable stuff that has been happening around here that could be very useful in talking about Dragon Ball. And yeah, Toyotaro and Uchida talking about it feels like two buddies patting themselves on the back. Oh, what a great job we've done! But also, we did that in December. And honestly, I can't blame them for this particular bit. They seem to be genuinely proud of what they've done. Sometimes you just want to nerd out about the stuff that you've made and talk about the experience, and if you love the stuff you make, then… And if, coincidentally, the stuff you make happens to be the successor of one of the biggest manga franchises in the world, then yeah, I guess they can call themselves proud, even if the current status of said medium is questionable. Still, since the official page wasn't around all that much during the Morrow arc, we'll be mostly discussing some insight into the Granola and superhero sagas, as well as some different tidbits regarding the franchise as a whole. So, we know that Toyotaro designed our favourite Cerulean, and is quite proud of their design. He wanted him to feel a bit out of time, with futuristic gear mixed up with that steampunk aesthetic of oatmeal, and credit where credit's due. The way Granola looks is quite memorable. Now the heaters were a very different can of worms altogether. Apparently, Toyotaro had been attempting to get the design approvals for these characters a total of three times until Toriyama was happy with his results. The younger author even considered begging his master to provide the concept art for him since he was really struggling. You know, Toriyama providing some help? but. It seemed like he wasn't forthcoming, but the two characters he found the hardest to draw were Elec, due to his very distinct facial structure, and to be honest, yeah, he does not suffer from the Super Saiyan perfect cell face syndrome in that they all look the same, even Moro fell foul to that, and of course Maki. She was a little oddball, in the sense that Toyotaro claims that he isn't very good with feminine cute characters, which I don't think is quite true. I think he's selling himself short. Although I suppose Kale was easier for him if he was used to drawing all those bulky characters. We do feel that his responses about that particular topic were kind of juvenile for a 45 year old man. You know, horses for courses, cultural differences, etc. But what was pretty interesting, however, was how this entire story came to be. Toyotaro had the idea for Granola and wanted some story that would be connected to the Saiyans for a long time, whilst Toriyama came up with a lot of the background lore. For example, even if the protagonist was the brainchild of the artist formerly known as Toybull himself, most of the lore around the character was created by his sensei, including some rather interesting notes about Cerulean's liking to fight but not being a warrior race. Toyotaro always wanted Granola to be a sniper character, a lone wolf. Sniper wolf? but it made him an incredibly silent character, very stoic. It was actually Toriyama that suggested the inclusion of a sidekick for the bounty hunter. So we know what he is thinking, so they could continue the long line of trademark Dragon Ball duos. Good idea. Another thing that came from the author were all the stuff concerning the Namekian revelations, especially the fact that they didn't originate on Namek, this giving even more credibility about the meta plot with this particular race, not being something limited to the manga, and could be seen carry over to different types of media, which is very important. The infamous Bardock bits are the effect of their mutual collaboration. Toyotaro loves the character, and Toriyama seems to have grown fond of this character over the years. So. 
To anyone who is already kind of bitter about the likes of Dragon Ball Minus, this really should not come as a big shock to you. So yeah, we can't exactly pin the blame on one of them. Sorry about that. Sorry to break it to y'all, but seeing what decisions Toyotaro is allowed to make versus the ones he's not allowed to make, I do think that certain very infamous wishes might have come from the very top. It isn't 100% confirmed, but based on conversations, it tends to feel that they are stunted. It feels this way. What he could do, however, was design Ultra Ego. That's right. That was 100% Toyotaro, with of course his master's approval. And in case anyone missed it, he interpreted Mastered Ultra Instinct as Goku becoming more similar to Whis. So in order to do the opposite with Vegeta becoming more like Beerus, he gave him some Beerus-like features, mainly a lack of eyebrows, the hair colour being similar to Beerus's skin, and of course that trademark feline-like smile. Now the thing that felt like was the most interesting revelation was concerning the whole Black Freezer thing. Apparently, this whole saga has been written in a way, so they've always had the character at the back of their heads in a way, like a hidden main character just waiting to be released, a driving force behind everything that goes on in the Granola Saga. And when rereading that whole thing, you kind of feel it. But despite the overall coolness of this entire scene in Chapter 87, it did feel kind of out of the blue and did rob Granola of a proper ending, which is something we are quite disappointed with. Now, it does seem that this inclusion was a plan from the very beginning. It wasn't a total surprise or a seat of the pants thing, as both Uchida and Toyotaro had this form in mind for quite some time. Black holes and jokingly, black credit cards being cited as inspirations. But even the author himself acknowledges that maybe it felt a little bit too sudden. Now, the tough thing about this is that we don't know if this form of Freezer will venture out outside of the medium, or if this was conceived by the two manga brothers, but we'll have to wait and see. And one last thing. This is actually Blue Evolution on the cover. Since Toyotaro wanted to have some connective tissue to the anime, even though the transformation wasn't shown in the manga. Now, he did mention that this doesn't mean that different shades will always mean, well, different forms as Saiyans are allowed to have the same form look slightly different, but in the case of Blue Evolution, it was a form that was already familiar with the fans, so even if they didn't see how it came to be in the manga, it does exist in the manga timeline. Now, let's get to the superhero part of the story. The most interesting bit is that Toyotaro was previously interested in making a spin-off featuring Trunks as the main character before the movie was even a thing. Originally, it was supposed to be its own thing, a spin-off series, a little side manga like the Yamcha reincarnation thing, without featuring any costumes shenanigans whatsoever. And it seems that he and Uchida were interested in tackling more stories that wouldn't necessarily feature Goku as the main character. It was Toriyama who actually suggested tying it to the story of the new movie. He also helped Toyotaro design the suits for our protagonist, citing the need to make them retro and a bit old-fashioned to not overdo the cool factor. Also, it's clear that the younger of the authors really enjoyed drawing this part of the story, especially the high school segment. He stated that it has been a while since he designed Earthlings with actual names, and also he attempted some romantic comedy, but we're split on that. Anyway. Much like us, he does really enjoy the character of Dr. Hedo, so he was quite excited to flesh him out a little bit more, his backstory and himself as a character. And interestingly, there isn't much insight into the movie retelling proper, because the next interviews sum up his work on the manga as a whole, as he cites chapter 31 as being the one that was most praised by his mentor, possibly due to a lot of connective tissues within the world being present. Now, admittedly, he also sells a little bit of BS here, saying that he rarely relies on references to particular elements from the past and does them only when they are necessary. And yeah, sorry mate, no. It's bad that you're trying to bamboozle us about this, but it's even worse if you're not aware of it. Yeah, no, I don't think anyone's buying that, sorry. But we don't want to end this on such a sour note because even though the fandom may have some issues with the new author, I mean, I say new, he's been nearly doing this for a decade now. He definitely does have a very unique understanding of Toriyama 
as an author. He proposes that some of his explanations for being lazy are merely just examples of modesty, and he has some pretty convincing arguments to back up his theory. This, even though it should have been obvious, kind of blew our minds. He didn't want to dominate one colour over the other, and wanted to make the reading process consistent and easy for the eyes. And honestly, if you reread this, you can kind of see it. Now, another thing to consider are the famous wasteland battles. When we talk about them, we often do think about the kind of boring backgrounds in the anime, like they always want to go to a wasteland, but that wasn't how Dragon Ball started. It was a manga with just two colours. That wasn't made because he was lazy, it was made because of visual clarity. I mean, we all know that Toriyama likes to troll with his answers and come up with different answers for different interviews, and everything he says should be taken with a grain of salt, but honestly, a lot of us never question these bits. Yeah, he did those because he is lazy, and then that theory amongst the western world just kind of stuck. But if you think about it, the man was a very active author for a very long time. He was drawing Dragon Ball manga on a weekly basis for over a decade for crying out loud. Haven't we been giving the man enough credit? Did Toyotaro just change our view on other things related to the franchise? What? However you feel about it, it's clear that both Uchida and the former Toy Ball care about the manga. We might not always agree with their particular tastes, but we do see that even they recognise the need for some kind of novelty with the manga. But seeing all of the power plays on display, it might seem like the creative force behind the manga is beating their heads against a brick wall to make them conform to what they want. Especially when you learn that Toriyama gets Toyotaro's work after the editors have already gone through it. It's almost the last step. I always thought that the order was the exact opposite. But still, seeing those interviews and suffering through the loading times on the website gave me some newfound appreciation for the medium. Well, minus Toyotara's comments about not referencing old stuff. We strongly recommend you watch these, as they are all available for free on the official site. Did you learn anything new? Was this theory about Toriyama from Toyotaro news to you? Be sure to let us know in the comments, and until next time, we shall see you in the next video. Catch you later!